All right. Um, and I mentioned Pastor John Hodge. Uh, <coughs> when I interviewed Senator Doug Mastriano, uh, we were talking off the air before we went on, and uh, we were talking about Brother Hodge, and he was going to be with him. And uh, he said, I've known Brother Hodge for a long time. He said he served in the Army as well. And he said he's a veteran. He's a national hero. But he said he's a hero of the faith. And he's right. Uh, but keep Brother Hodge in prayer, if you would, please, because against all odds and diseases, he's battling and still standing. Hasn't eaten a meal in probably two and a half years. He's lived off the feeding tube. Uh, but he opted to be able to preach and speak rather than that. And so uh, just keep him before the Lord in prayer for his folks. And uh, God's doing a great work through him down there in McConnellsburg. Well, turn to Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse number 3. Jeremiah 33 and verse number 3. We'll use this verse to get started with for our little golden nugget of truth tonight. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, God told us to call on him. He told Jeremiah this. He put in his word because he's telling us this. And he says for us to call on his name. We're to come to him with our needs, to come to Him with our requests. We want Him to show us great and mighty things, then we need to call on Him and ask Him to show us those great and mighty things. It just, it's, it's so important that we spend time with God in prayer. Call unto me, and I will show thee great and mighty things. Now, this is a promise. You believe it? Amen? You realize there are many prayers recorded in the Scripture? A long prayer is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 12 through 53. Solomon prayed. There was a man who loved God, who inherited a kingdom... From his dad, only partial. There was a little bit of insurrection, rebellion, after his uh, reign ended. But here was a man who came to the throne of Israel when Israel was at the zenith of her power. David had on his heart to build a permanent place where they would worship God, where God would exist in his Shekinah glory. It must have been an awesome sight to stand there and see what took place. The house was filled with the smoke of the glory of God. To the extent that the priests and the Levites couldn't even be in there to minister. Can you imagine that? What an awesome sight when God showed up in all of his glory. And Solomon prayed and dedicated that temple to the Lord. Jeremiah, many years later, with a broken heart, pleaded with the people in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem to get their hearts right with God. And God gave a promise, and he reiterated that promise to God's people. What makes a prayer a good prayer? It's not necessarily length or eloquence. Jesus talked about those Pharisees that loved to be seen of men that would stand in the streets and impress people with their long prayers. God wasn't interested in that. He wanted to hear a prayer from the heart. A heart that simply trusts the mighty God in answering prayer. A prayer answering God. A miracle working God. A God that loves us, a God that hears us when we pray. Now, there are some long prayers in the Scripture, but I also noticed ten short prayers that are listed in the Scripture. 
Now, if you want to follow along with me, we go to first, let me, where do I went? Genesis chapter 24. Got to start there. Genesis chapter 24. This is the servant of Abraham. <clears throat> he was sent on a mission to find a bride for Abraham's son. Not a heathen girl. Not of the Canaanites or the Perizzites or the Hittites, these people around here. We don't want my son to be married to a heathen that may worship other gods. We need a godly girl. He went to that place, uh, Laban's house. And in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 12, Abraham's servants, he gets there and he prays. He asked God for direction for the mission he was on. Verse 12, and he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Now here's his specific request. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, uh, drink and I will give thy camels drink also. And, and let the same be that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. He had a specific request. He was on a mission. Lord, I'm praying for the right girl. Lord, could you show me the right one in this method? When the girls come to draw water, and this pretty girl shows up and I'll say, uh, can we get some water for my... You know, I'm thirsty. Oh, and let me let me help your camels too. He said that would be the sign. Well, you begin to read the verses that follow. It came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born of Bethuel of the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. Well, guess what? She answered that request. She was the answer to prayer. This was a short, specific prayer. Lord, can you show me that sign that I can believe that this is the one? Well, she had to agree to go. Her family had to agree to it. And of course, they did. Now, I want you to go over there, if you would, please, to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, one of my great heroes of the Old Testament is none other than Elijah, the extraordinary prophet of old. Elijah <clears throat> prayed that it would not rain. We're told that in James chapter 5, verse 17. He prayed that it would not rain. Why? He was burdened for his country. He wanted to see his country come back to God. The country was under the leadership of two of the most wicked people that were on the face of the earth at that time, Ahab and Jezebel. And they were so wicked, Elijah said, God, we got to do something. Can we stop the rain? All I know is the Bible tells me that he prayed and it stopped raining. Well, one day he went to meet Ahab. He said, we need to have a showdown. Ahab said, oh, so you're the fundamental Christian that's causing all the trouble around here, huh? He said, no, it's you and your house because you've forsaken the Lord. Praise God for Elijah. He wasn't afraid and he did not back down. Well, he says, we need to have a showdown and let Israel see who the true and living God is. So here's all the Baal Worshipper Ministerial Association gathered together. 400 prophets, 450 prophets, the groves, 850 total. That's a big crowd. And they met on Mount Carmel. Why Mount Carmel? 
On Mount Carmel, there was a broken down altar that has been broken down for about 70 years. Elijah repaired that altar. Let the God that answers by fire, let it be known he's a true and living God. Now, you say Elijah put God on the spot. But as we read his prayer, we find that he was doing what God told him to do. So these prophets of Baal, they went through all their religious contortions and everything else. <clears throat> nothing happened. Well, you, you pray to a God that doesn't exist, nothing's going to happen. Amen. <laughs> okay. And then Elijah told him to pour water all over the sacrifice. He said, I don't want you thinking this, that it just was a spark that the sun did or something, you know. And <clears throat> then he starts praying. It came to pass, verse 36 of 1 Kings chapter 18. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, now here's his prayer, 63 words. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Did God answer prayer? Look at verse 38. And then the fire of the Lord fell. So he prayed, and the answer came. We go to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. There's a guy here by the name of Jabez, one of the descendants of Judah, of the tribe of Judah. We don't know a whole lot about him, but this is amazing right here. The Bible says, Jabez, in verse 9 of chapter 4, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. The poor guy, what a name. Jabez, I mean, you know, uh, uh, through the prayer of faith, he overcame the sorrow that was indicated by the meaning of his name. Look at verse number 10, okay? Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast or my borders, my influence. That's the prayer that we read that Jabez prayed. He was born in a time of sorrow. His name reflected that. Poor guy. What a start. What an attitude that surrounded his name. But here it's recorded that he prayed. We don't know anything else about him, but he prayed. And if we keep reading in verse 10, God answered his prayer that thine hand would be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me, and God granted him that which he requested. So here's a short prayer, covers about almost a verse of scripture, and God answered his prayer. Go to Second Chronicles, and chapter, oh, let me see, chapter 14. Second Chronicles, and chapter 14, here we read about a king by the name of Asa. Second Chronicles chapter 14 and verse number 11. Now, the Ethiopians were at war with God's people. Asa had to carry his troops and lead his battle, army into battle. They came out against Zerah, the Ethiopian the host, a thousand, thousand. They were outnumbered. Asa went out against him. They said in battle array, verse 11, 
And Asa cried unto the Lord his God. And he said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether they're with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. They were outnumbered. God, we're outnumbered, but Lord, you can handle it. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. We'll look at the next verse. And so the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. They won. They were prepared for battle physically, but they knew that they needed to rely on the Lord. And we have some battles today that need to be fought, but we're not going to do it in the arm of the flesh. We're going to need God's strength. But we need to stand in God's strength when he tells us to stand. Well, let's go on to, uh, let's go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 14, I like this. Matthew chapter 14. Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, plus women and children, miraculously. He tells his disciples to get on a boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is a very interesting place, 630-some feet below sea level. I mean, you can stand on the road marked sea level, and you're looking down in the valley at the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is a scene of sudden storms quite often, been that way. And God puts his people in a boat. Jesus said, you go on the boat and go on the other side. So they got in the boat. And they started across in the middle of the night. It grew dark. There came a storm at sea. Well, we look at verse 30 of chapter <clears throat> 14. And uh, there's Peter. I flipped my page too far. And, and, and there's Peter seeing Jesus walking on the water. They're in the midst of the storm. The Bible said they were afraid. They were scared. The waves were coming in. The Bible says that Jesus went to them walking on the water. The disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. They cried out for fear. I mean, they already were scared with the storm, and then this happens. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Then Peter, now he was always ready to do something. And so Peter answered, and he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And so Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water so to go to Jesus. Think about it. Peter got to walk on the water. The other 11 sat in the boat, startled and amazed, I'm sure. But wait a minute. Peter looks around. Look at verse 30. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, O oh, thou God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and all the Boam boy. He didn't have time to say all that. He was sinking. Lord, save me! Very short prayer, wasn't it? Did God answer his prayer? Yeah. That prayer was sincere from the heart. Uh, Peter was scared he was going to drown. I guess he wasn't ready to drown yet. But he prayed a simple prayer. And God answered his prayer. Uh, flip over to the next chapter, chapter 15. We read about the prayer of the Canaanite woman. In chapter 15, verse 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, 
Have mercy on me, O Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. A Canaanite woman, she wasn't a Jew. But interesting little lesson here. Uh, Jesus answered her not a word. His disciples came and saw it and said, send her away. She crieth after us. She's bothering us. And he answered and said, I am not sent unto the lost. Uh, am I not sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And then came she and worshipped him. She knelt down and worshipped Jesus. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Canaanite. You know, the heathen folks, but she worshiped Jesus. She had a need, she came to Jesus. She prayed to Jesus. Not a formal prayer that she read somewhere that was written down for her to say. She prayed from the heart. There was a need and she cried out to the Lord to meet that need. She came near and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. She was desperate and she came to Jesus. Jesus answered her prayer and he said, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. He answered her prayer. Here was a woman that was not a Jew, was not supposed to be a believer, but she was. Out of a believing heart, she cried out to the Lord and God answered her prayer. Go to Mark chapter 16. We're here in the New Testament. Mark chapter 16. There was a blind man. <clears throat> I said, what did I say? Chapter 16, chapter 10. I'm sorry. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 51. Here is a man that cried out. Have mercy on me. That's his prayer. Many charged him saying he should hold his peace. You're embarrassing us. Shh. Hmm. But he cried out the more. He cried out for mercy. Somebody said he's calling for you. The master's calling for you. The Bible said casting away his garment in verse 50. He came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, this was his prayer request, that I might receive my sight. He believed Jesus could give him sight. And he prayed that Jesus would give him sight. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. A short prayer from the heart out of desperation. But God answered that prayer. Go over there to chapter 17. No, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And we read about 10 lepers. Now, if you had leprosy, that was a contagious, highly contagious incurable, fatal disease. These guys were in a quarantined leper colony outside of town. And the Bible says, as Jesus drew near, they cried out. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 13. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves to the priest. You see, it was the priest that would declare whether they were leprous or not. For them to go to the priest meant they would have to go in faith believing. Otherwise, they knew that they would not even be allowed to approach him or any other person. He said, go show yourselves to the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. They cried out for mercy. They had leprosy. And Jesus said, okay, here's your answer. Go show yourself to the priest. As they started, they noticed they were cleansed. Jesus answered their prayer. 
in Luke chapter 18 and verse number 13, the next chapter over, we find that there was a publican, there was a Pharisee and a publican, pray, and publican was an, a tax collector that worked for Rome. And as far as the Jews were concerned, they were sinners, they were enemies, they were traitors, they would have nothing to do with them. And so here's the Pharisee praying thus with himself and making a big show in front of everybody of how religious he was. And then in verse 13, the publican standing afar off would not even lift so much his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What did Jesus say? I tell you, this man went down his house justified rather than the other for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased. But he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Here was a man that humbled himself and just asked God for mercy, believing that he was a sinner. Jesus answered his prayer. Now I want you to go, to, we're still in the gospel, Luke, go to chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, and this will be number 10. So this will be the last one that I'm going to give you. Luke chapter 23, and look at verse number 42. Our dear Savior is hanging on the cross in excruciating pain and agony. There were malefactors on either side being executed for the crimes they committed. One of those malefactors said, if you're really a son of God, why don't you get us out of this mess? He was always trying to get off the hook, you know. Wouldn't take responsibility for the consequences of his sin. But the other believed that Jesus was the innocent, spotless, pure son of God. He obviously wasn't a religious man. He was a criminal being executed for his crimes. But believing that Jesus was dying for his sin, he prayed a simple prayer. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Did God answer his prayer? Yeah. The very next verse, Jesus said, this day, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That thief on the cross made a decision that day. He decided that he had ruined his life. He was a sinner. He deserved to die and go to hell. But he cried out to Jesus out of a heart that believed. God hears prayer from the heart. It's not the eloquence. It's not the flowery words. It's whether the prayer is from the heart. Go to John chapter 15. Let me give you a closing thought here. John chapter, John's gospel chapter 15. Look at verse number seven. Jesus is talking about fruit bearing here. And he said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Hey, my words, yeah, the Bible. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. That's a promise. Amen. Do we appropriate that promise? Look at verse number 16. Jesus said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye ask the father in my name, he may give it. Believe the Lord is his word in your heart. He's promised to answer prayer according to his word. You do the will of God. You're bearing fruit. You're living for the Lord. You're serving him. He's promised to answer prayer. Lord, thank you for what we've looked at tonight in your word. I pray we'll be encouraged. Thank you, Lord, that you do hear us when we pray. You do care for us. Thank you, Lord for the promises to answer prayer. And I pray, Lord, we'd appropriate that promise. And from our heart, we would pray for that lost sinner that we know. 
for that dear relative that does not know Christ. For a nation that has turned its back on thee. For people we know that are wallowing in the muck and the mire of sin. May we out of a heart of compassion and belief pray. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.